morning. We enter into worship today with hope in our hearts. Something happens here that reminds us that we can live as God desires. God has made a promise of faithfulness to us, and that's a promise that we can trust in. Please pray with me. Father, we ask your help in discovering the plans that you have for us. Please give us the courage to complete those plans. We pray that our time of worship will be pleasing to you and meaningful to each one of us. We are grateful that you are always with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our scripture this morning is from Jeremiah, uh, chapter 29, one of my favorite verses, which is, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Then he goes on to talk about the blessings. I always, I should have brought it up here. I always forget the, exactly how he words it after that, but it's about blessings, you know, that God's going to, going to put in our lives or put in the Israelites' lives at that time. What is easy to forget is that the verses right before that are about them being in exile and not being very happy or content and feeling probably like God has abandoned them. And I'm sure that all of us have felt like God has abandoned us at some point. And I want to tell the kids at home that, or talk to the kids at home about how sometimes you think mom and dad have abandoned you. There's something that you really want and they're saying no. Or there's something you don't want to do, and they're saying, yes, you will. For example, your parents might say, I know the plans I have for you when they make you brush your teeth. I have plans that you will have a full set of teeth when you leave home. I know the plans I have for you when I make you go to bed on time. My plans are that you will be able to have, be refreshed in the next morning, not get in so much trouble, and if it's school, then you have an opportunity to learn when you're at school, or maybe the plans I have for you when I make you eat breakfast before you go to school so that you can think and learn and and have some energy in your body as you go to school. So there are times when our parents tell us things that, that we don't like or put us in situations that we don't like, and it's really because they know the plans that they have for you. And God is so much the same way. There are things that we go through in our lives that we don't like 
and we wonder where God is, yet we can always know that God knows the plans that he has for us, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we're grateful that, that you see far beyond our ability to see, that you know what is best for us, you know how you're going to get us through tough situations, and you know how you're going to turn a negative into a positive, a challenge into a blessing, and we are so grateful. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture does come from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 14. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisha, son of Shephan and, Ger and Gamariah, Gamariah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, Only when Babylon's seventy years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Word of God for the people of God. Join with me in a brief prayer. O oh, awesome Redeemer, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and Savior. Amen. So, it's camp season. Many of us at First Christian Church, we are familiar with the Christian camp, the Disciples of Christ Christian camp in the Ohio region. It's only 30 miles east of us, and we have several individuals from this congregation involved with the summer programs there. I'm talking, of course, of Camp Christian in uh, Magnetic Springs. Camp experiences can be extremely formative to the faith and to the social development of children. Personally, I did not go to Camp Christian as a child. Of course, you all know, many of you know, that I'm from Michigan. But we had a Disciples of Christ camp in Michigan. It was called Crystal Conference Center. 
Si, si, si. I did not go to Camp Crystal as a child either, though. Even though I did not attend Christian camps as a young camper, I am very familiar with the impact those places have on people of all ages and of every generation. I did not get involved with camp ministry until after I graduated from college. I volunteered, I worked, I counseled, I led, and I participated in programs through four different Disciples of Christ Christian camps in three different states. All of those camps are sacred and are holy ground because of the, of the work that is done there. The intentional time it takes to bring in a staff, train that staff, plan for a week or weekend worth of materials and get everybody on speed so that every person that comes in can have an experience. It takes a lot of time and effort and dedication so that these campers, retreaters, people can receive an experience. In my first experience at a Christian camp, it came to me as a counselor. The impression I walked away with was the impression that I got on the first day of camp. These kids were more advanced in their faith than I was in mine. I regularly attended church on Sundays ever since I can remember. I was raised in the church. And I continued to attend Disciples of Christ churches throughout my entire time in college. So how was it that these fifth graders could have a deeper commitment and a stronger connection to God than me? How come they knew so much more about how God impacted them and the world they lived in? Why were they more faithful than me? At my first church camp experience, I recognized that I needed to work a lot harder at living into my faith if I was going to proclaim that I had a faith to live into. Attending church on Sunday mornings, for me, that wasn't enough. That didn't cut it. I needed more development beyond one hour on Sunday morning. I had to reach out and discover a network of fellow disciples in the region that could plug me into events and introduce me to other disciples that would help me develop my own identity and my faith. Of course, my pastors all played a role in that too as well. I discovered there were camp activities and retreats for people who were not school children. I had no idea. I'm still discovering ways that disciples in the Ohio region and throughout the United States and Canada that are trying to help individuals as well as congregations along their own spiritual journeys. Today's passage, specifically looking at Jeremiah chapter 21, or, or, I'm sorry, 29, verse 11, I pressed it there, 29, 11, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope. This verse is a verse that gives its readers a great sense of optimism and confidence. We can be confident our God will protect us and bless us from this time forward just as God has been with us all the time through the generations up until the point where we are now. This is a message of hope and of love. These are things that draw us into congregations on Sunday mornings. And we're called to live within our context, live within the place that we are, live within our community. And by live, I mean we're supposed to live with vibrancy and enthusiasm for the hope that we have for the future. 
one day we will be better off than we are now. We are not so destitute that we have no hope because we know that we are not alone. We're journeying together. There are people that we don't even know that want us to succeed. And we also know that we are healthy enough to move forward. Healthy enough to do and to act within our own faith because our faith is healthy. We should celebrate and be grateful for the gifts that we the gifts that we have received from the generations before us to give us all the things that are around us and for what we have accomplished within our own lives. We are called to be generous by our own God of abundance, our God of provision, our God of security. Let's be intentional about reflecting on what we have that we can share with others. Let's be motivated to act in ways that are inspired by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, from our scriptures, our traditions, and the faith that has been passed down to us by our elders. First Christian Church here in Bellefont, Ohio, we are entering a new season of life. And this excites me a great deal. I'm excited to be here, and I hope all of you are too. There have been a number of things that have just been lining up. We call this the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Things for me, such as my own preaching, I think it's impacted a few of others. But there's been some informal conversations. And then there's been small group discussions. And then we've, that's led into long-term planning and now we're having conversations with denominational leaders and we're seeing grants for or opportunities for grants and most importantly what we have is a faithfully committed congregation committed to one another committed to the disciples committed here to our neighbors so let's listen to the words of Jeremiah and invest in ourselves. Let's buy the land, build the homes, grow the crops, and stay committed to God, the God that is committed to us. We know that our God is a generous God. Simply enduring the struggles we find ourselves in the midst of, just enduring, that is not what God calls us to do. We need to take action and to make something happen. It's on us to be accountable for the future of the church. One action we can take is to live generously, just as our God repeatedly demonstrated for us, continues to demonstrate for us. And we can revisit verses 13 and 14 from chapter 29. When you search for me, I will find you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back. When faced with a choice, Jeremiah was the prophet that relayed God's message of hope. The exiled from Jerusalem, King Jeconiah, the queen mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths had already all been taken and dispersed throughout Babylon. The choices of the exiles, as presented by conflicting prophets, were to either run and try and escape from Babylon or to try and smash it to the ground from within, openly revolt. Jeremiah's prophecy was different and unexpected. Jeremiah's message relayed from God was to stay in Babylon, seek the shalom, peace of the land that brought you into exile, and pray to the Lord for shalom to come to it so that peace will come to you. 
This is the only place in the Old Testament where there is an explicit command to pray for one's enemies and the unbelievers. Jesus draws from the mandate found in the Gospels when he says to pray for those who persecute you. God in Jeremiah 29 commands that the Israelite exiles, despite their feelings of depression, isolation, and anxiety, that they look beyond their personal well-being and prosperity. God says to seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, because in its welfare you will find your welfare. The Israelites are surprised. They are being encouraged to take time and resources to build houses and plant gardens in a foreign land that wants them to lose their own cultural identity. God is telling the exiled to cooperate with the local forces of power to help Babylon be a place of peace and prosperity that will provide abundantly for all. By telling the exiled Israelites to build houses, to go to work, to marry, and to pray for their new communities, God is, in fact, telling the Israelites to resist the allure of succumbing to their feelings of despair, dismay, numbness. God says to make the best of a bad situation and to try to move forward and survive. First Christian Church, I would not say that we are in an exile. For me, First Christian Church is more like in a period of sabbatical. We're taking a rest to focus inwardly on ourselves. By now, hopefully, we have some insight about our faith as individuals and our own personal identity. The challenge for us is to go out and do something. What have we been renewing ourselves for if not to take an action? All the work we have done, investing in ourselves as individuals, is leading us to a moment where we can invest collectively into the church as one body of faith. Next week, there will be a special worship service at 10 o'clock where a presentation following worship will be presented to the congregation by the leadership, the church leadership, not by me. I'm excited for that for next Sunday. I really do hope as many people possible come next Sunday. But being completely open and honest with you, there will be a time period when you are asked to contribute financially to a special program. And also, in full disclosure, due to your continuous generosity over the months, we already have a plan to fully pay and finance the program going forward. Let's celebrate that. Celebrate what we can do and what we've done. It will also be a special Sunday because there will be a child dedication. A time where we can all claim vows together to raise up the generations that will follow us. Some we don't even know who they will be. But we can reclaim our own faith and make a promise and commitment to share our faith and to pass down our love of Christ and our understanding of what our faith calls us to do and how we are to be and exist in this world. A child dedication. And then it'll be followed by a potluck fellowship meal where we can sit around tables and have conversations with people about what our faith means to us and where our faith has brought us to and what we think our faith will guide us into in the future. With what we know about ourselves, let's honor it. Let's share and express it openly. Let's share it first with the congregation and then move outward into the community. For those of us that are here and now, we are the foundation 
that future ministries of First Christian Church will be built on. The land has already been purchased. The gardens have already been planted. There are people within our midst that are faithful to a God that is faithful to us. We simply just need to act. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we, we come here this morning, and if we think very hard, we can come up with lots and lots of concerns that we have. We're concerned about our world and the state of, of the world with conflicts, with illness, with things that are, that are going on in the world, injustice, yet you have a plan for the world. May we trust you in that. We have concerns about our country. We still have so much discord politically. We still have so much misinformation that is being, that is being put out there. We still have injustice even in this great country. Yet you have a plan for the United States. May we trust you in it. We have concerns for our community and, and the issues that, that are here, uh, way too much addiction, people struggling with, with, that, with those addictions, a number of people with dire financial situations, difficult finding housing, yet you have a plan for Bell Fountain, Ohio. May we trust you with your plans. We have concerns about our congregation, about our size, and can we stay financially viable, and yet you have a plan for this congregation. We are still here because you have a plan. May we trust you in your plan. And we have individual concerns, whether they be health issues, whether they be conflicts within our family or friend group, whether they be financial, and you have a plan for each of us. May we trust you in your plan. And as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you ever envy the disciples? They heard Jesus' words. They knew him personally. They called him friend. Thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a pal and a confidant. And if you threw a party, invited everyone you knew, you would see the biggest gift would be from me. And the card attached would say, thank you for being a friend. I love those lyrics from the Golden Girls theme song. But I think they apply to Jesus and, and to this table. When we come to the Lord's table, we see what looks like ordinary bread and juice. We need to see past that and realize we are celebrating the availability of Jesus' unconditional love and friendship to us all. And when we participate in this celebration, we are saying to Jesus, thank you for being my friend. Remember the night on the night when Christ was betrayed. After the bread had been blessed, he took it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance for me. And in similar fashion, after the cup too had been blessed, he said, This cup. This is my blood. This is a new covenant, a covenant poured out for the salvation for everyone. And I promise you, I shall not drink from it again until I drink it fresh and new with each and every one of you in my Father's kingdom of heaven. For as often as you eat of this loaf and drink of this cup, you proclaim the, the death of the Lord until he comes again. Please pray with me. Gracious God, here at this table, we are in the company of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, and friend. Thank you for the blessings that we are able to carry in our hearts because of the sacrifice Jesus was willing to make on our behalf. You have revealed your loving ways to us in this broken bread in this cup. May we pour those blessings out wherever we go, lighting up the darkness by sharing your unconditional love with all we encounter. We pray that we live to be all that you have destined us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please pray with me. Gracious and generous Lord, we thank you for giving us Jesus Christ, your Son, whose presence we celebrated today here at this table. We ask you to continue to bless us, that we be the people that sounds the sound of praises to you, O Lord, that your praises may be heard through us. Amen. Let us stand and sing, right? Stand and sing our closing hymn together. on with our benediction together um, it's hard when you're holding on to information you don't know how to get it out <laughs> to everybody um, we used to when we did our pastoral prayers we used to take call and response but for video and not knowing who's comfortable with what um, but are there concerns and prayers and joys people wish to share people we should be adding to our list there's something specifically I do want to share with you all but Maybe I'll go first. Christine and I were expecting. So, <laughs> those of us that already attended Cafe Grace were not surprised by that. Um, but you all need to know too, as well. So, yeah, Linda. Her name is Ina, I-N-A? I-N-A. All right, and she's at OSU Hospital, and you know, we're praying for her health. My mom turned 85 on Friday. We successfully <laughs> pulled off the surprise party where since we beat the show. So, wow. Uh, we were real pleased with that. Yeah, very good. A surprise party where 65 people showed up. That's quite an endeavor. Congratulations mostly to your mom. So. <laughs> Tim. Okay, a friend of the Notstein family, Dave Woods, getting ready for he's surgery. Already he's already had he's surgery. Home. He's home. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it sounds like there's a number of people, but praying for Dave Woods. Kathy. What society was that again? 5P minus. The 5, 5 P minus. 
And there's a society that got together, or I'm, there is a society, and within locally within Bellefontaine, Logan County, and they had a picnic yesterday together, and it was a wonderful event for all those people and families to come together. Terry's birthday is tomorrow. Congratulations. Happy, Happy birthday. So, what's that? D Dale's waving at me. Yes. Young man up on Brown Street, Jim Greenbaum, needs a lot of care and prayer. Young man, his name's Kim Greenbaum. All right, we'll be praying for Grant Kim. He's got some, some real some issues. All right, we'll be praying for, for Kim and, and health and recovery limitations. All right. Um, thank you all for sharing your celebrations, your concerns, and for letting it go out on the airwaves so that people can see this too. Um, it is the church, it is who we are. Uh, we are a community that prays for one another and for people that aren't necessarily part of our own community, but part of our larger community. But let us, um, I'll do a quick prayer and then we'll do our benediction together. Uh, loving Lord, thank you for blessing us with this time together and we ask you to bless all those individuals whose names have been lifted up and we are grateful for all the celebrations that coincide and move right along with all the things that bring us grief. It's just the, the human life and the life cycle that we are all in, and we are grateful for it, and grateful for you to guide us through all the times, in good and, and in not so good. Join me in our benediction together from Shane Claiborne. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to our doors. Peace of Christ be with you. Amen.